When it comes to artificial intelligence and automation, there are two common opposing schools of thought. One says that AI, artificial intelligence, is on its way to solve all of our problems, work for humans, and allow us to perform at peak capacity in our jobs. Another says that it's on its way to take those jobs from us entirely and leave a substantial part of the population behind. The truth probably lies somewhere between these extremes, and here to help us find out is Georgia Tech Associate Professor Mark Riddell. In this episode, we'll discuss the goals of automation, the challenges to accessibility, and ultimately, how to ensure that these changes work for everyone and not just a portion of the population. I'm Ayana Howard, Chair of Georgia Tech School of Interactive Computing, and this is the Interaction Hour. Mark received his Ph.D. from North Carolina State in 2004, where he innovated novel intelligent technologies for automatically generating stories and experiences in virtual worlds. He joined Georgia Tech in the School of Interactive Computing in 2007 and leads the Entertainment Intelligence Lab, where he's an expert in areas ranging from artificial intelligence, computing game AI, storytelling, and much, much more. (laughs) This is exciting. Thanks for joining us, Mark. My pleasure to be here. So I want to start first with your background in this area. Your research hasn't necessarily been directed in this area of automation in the workforce, right? Um, No, it's not something I originally started thinking about. Um, I had been spending the last few years thinking about computers and creativity and how computers can, or how we can advance the art and technology of making computers able to create at human levels to make art, music, computer games, and so on and so forth. And there are several things that come, you end up thinking about a lot. And one is how computers and humans work together. So we build systems that are creative. Now can we ask the question, can computers help humans uh, exhibit more creative ability or more creative skill along the way, which becomes much more about um, democratizing and making available computing technology to make people better at doing um, what they desire to do, but also you start thinking about whether people are better at doing their jobs. So, so, okay, better at jobs, which makes sense. But then do these systems remove the need for people then at some point? Um, Well, I think you can think about these in several different ways. You know, even if we're working on building computer technologies that can be the best they can, um, when you start thinking about partnering these things with computers, I don't think it's ever about the case that we have to remove the decision-making abilities from humans, or and especially in the creative context, right? We want to make sure that humans are always, you know, expressing their creative vision, their creative desires, their um, creative intent. And we look at the computer and say, well, where are the parts of the creative capacity, the ability to act on that intent? And can the computer step in and make uh, fill in the parts where people have more trouble or find things very difficult or tedious or hard to do. Okay, so um, I need a little bit of explanation. So computers will help individuals be more creative, but I recently heard about this um, art house, I think it was Christie's, Mm -hmm. that sold this painting, $432,000, and and it was a painting by an AI creature, an agent. So how did that help people? Well, yeah, no, that was, um phenomenal and astounding to everyone in the field. Um, I actually think that this, um, we can think about this as making a few points about um, democratization of artificial intelligence. Um, On the one hand, um, what this really meant was that people could go on the internet, find pieces of code, artificial intelligence, machine learning code out there and data, and train and build a system very, very quickly that made what you can think of as professional quality art least art that was someone was willing to pay a lot of money for right now you might kind of argue whether they were paying for the publicity or the (laughs) the hype or whether they it was actually good art but to me it's this like moment where you say well anyone can now make art that may or may not be good enough to be um, you know exhibited out in the real world outside of a home um, now, we're not quite at the po- point of full democratization. We're still dealing with you know, algorithms and code and those sorts of things. But then you look one step out and to say, well, can we wrap these in 
uh, human-centered interfaces uh, where now people can really go in and just with a few button clicks saying, this is what I had in my mind, now I can see it in front of me. Okay, so um, kind of poking a little bit deeper into this, um, and I like that term, democratization of, of AI. Um, so if, if we're thinking about AI and this creativity and enhancing the human, um, are we trying to create AI that can perform the same task as well? Or is it really just augmenting the human? Well, I think we can do it either way. So one of the challenging things about um, technology and, um, and computer science and algorithms is that we build these algorithms and they can be used in lots of different ways. Um, we can think about these things as replacing or doing what humans already do. Um, but we can also think about um, augmentation, right? So it's not necessary. So can we, um, you know, build things around our algorithms to say this is where the people need help and this is where we're going to apply our algorithms um, or these are the other places where people can use the algorithms or are we going to think about, um, you know, taking the whole thing and just say, well, how much of the things can we actually do? Okay, so let me think of an example. Um, say I'm a chef and I like to cook. How could AI help me with that? Because, you know, I don't know how to cook. <laughs> well, I think that's a great example because there's lots of things I think I also have, you know, lots of things that I want to do. Um, and I'm not necessarily skilled or trained uh, or have a lot of background in those things. So in the case of cooking, right, you can say, well, this is what I want to make. These are the flavors I like. But I don't know how to break that out into the composition of different ingredients and preparation styles and techniques. And there's a case where you can say, well, maybe can an artificial intelligence come in and say, um, let me help you with the preparation if I'm a robot, or let me tell you, here's how you can get to your goal, because those are the things you might need problems with. You might also say, you know, I'm a very talented sort of person, but I don't have an idea of how to like, apply my skills to new things. Can an artificial intelligence kind of also suggest you know, goals? So, uh, so um, this creativity thing, I, so I read somewhere, or maybe I read in an article that there was someone who created an AI agent around Frogger. Was that you? Uh, that was me, yes. And so how does that link with this world of creativity, or does it? Um, well, it links to the world of creativity. It links to the world of um, what I, again, kind of think of as human-centered artificial intelligence. So as we look at um, not just the algorithms, but the, the system of the human user and the algorithm working together, uh, there's lots of issues that come up. So the issue we've been talking about is um, where is the right place in the um, creative process or the work process to apply the intelligent system, to apply the algorithm. There are other issues that come up as well. So, and um, the Frogger work that you're referring to is about um, trust and comfort with using an artificial intelligence. So now we have put a black box artificial intelligence into a human's hands, and we hope that they'll use it effectively. Um, but we don't always understand the decisions that it makes or why it comes up with certain uh, outputs or outcomes. Um, and we need now to have recourse to be able to ask the computer, why did you do that? I think you made a mistake. I don't understand what you were thinking. It was very different from what I was thinking. And so we now look at um, what's called explainability or interpretability, uh, which is the ability to query an artificial intelligence, not just to perform a task, but then also explain how it was going about those tasks, what was important to it. So we can find, you know, was there discrepancies between what I was thinking and what the computer was thinking? Was it bad data? Was it um, a bad did I tell it the wrong thing, so on and so forth. Okay, so trust and comfort, um, explainability. So I can see how explainability can resolve some of the issues with, with trust and comfort with technology. But this seems like it might lead into another problem area. So now my AI systems can explain things to me. Um, and so I can I think of a, of a scenario where um, an AI system now knows basic tasks. I understand now as a, as a senior I say a manager in this area, I understand the basic tasks that the AI system says. And so then I think, ah, I got a lot of junior employees around here. And I actually understand what they do now. And I think my AI system may do it a little bit better. Is that a worry? It is, um, it is a legitimate concern. Because when we talk about intelligent systems that are ultimately designed to do things 
like humans or to perform tasks that humans can do, then we do have to think very hard again about um, what is the appropriate use of these technologies. Um, and, and people often go to this a little bit of alarmist sort of state that says, you know, um, we're going to remove people from the workforce. And I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, you know, productivity, at least in the Western cultures, United States, is very, very high. What that means is we're asking our employees to do more and more. Um, we, basically, there's more work that needs to be done in companies, in businesses, than really we have people to do it for. And that means, but not all work is equal, right? So you can think of um, what I think of as, so what we have to start thinking about this is not just the amount of work or who's doing the work, but the dignity of work. So there are parts of our jobs that are um, you know, really important and really kind of use all the full creativity and decision making and kind of those human aspects um, that only humans can do. And then there's other parts that um, you know, are more automatable. And then we have to start thinking about how many people do the work, but is everyone are we allowing everyone to do the most dignified work possible? So in, in, in one world, um, I think they called it dull, dirty, and dangerous kind of jobs. Is that what you're referring to? Or is it something bigger than that? Well, I think that's part of it. So, um, you know, robotics is going to have a big role in, um, you know, replacing human physical strength, right? So um, tasks in which you have to do heavy, dangerous lifting sorts of things. But then you can also look at... Um, you know, tasks that um, do not require a lot of cognitive um, requirements. So, um, I mean, so we can talk about cashiers or people who work in, you know, fast food industries who are basically over-glorified button pushers. And so the type of work, you're, you're really talking about quality of work, and it could be physical, it could be cognitive-based. And so these AI systems can come in. Um, and so I think about then what happens to those junior employees then? Um, they, their, their jobs might be explained away by the explainable AI. How can we mitigate this? Yeah, so this is, I think, the central question that comes before us. And there are parts that are technical, and then there are parts that are policy and sociological. So some of the technical issues that we can address is, um, can we build these intelligent systems with appropriate user interfaces so that um, people are not replaced but are able to move up into more dignified pieces of work so not every piece of technology has to replace someone or you know displace them I think is the term people like to use now um, but there's also still you know market factors and um, that we have to think about so what we really also have to think about which is a it's very frustrating because it's not a technology thing that I can necessarily do uh, when I design my algorithms. We have to think about what is the role of society as a whole in deciding when and how we should use these technologies. For example, um, we can pass laws that limit the use of automation. I'm not saying that's necessarily a good thing. Uh, we can look at our education systems and saying, are we training people for the jobs that will be more dignified in the places that we're going to need the most work, say in healthcare or um, you know, home comfort sorts of domains versus you know, physical labor, trucking, and so on and so forth. And these are all questions that strike us at the individual level in terms of technologists all the way up to the political levels and you know, how society benefits and thinks about work in the first place. Okay, so so I understand that, that we do have a role in, in mitigating this. Um, some of it is um, passing laws, although as, as citizens, it's kind of figuring out how that works. Education, um, interfaces, which I think as a technologist, computer scientist, we have the most impact on because we design this stuff all the time. Um, so what about technologies that can help everyday people? Um, are there things that you can think of in the AI space that um, outweigh kind of even maybe we are displacing individuals, but we really have to do this anyway. It's just we have to for the survival of humanity kind of thing. Yeah, no, I think we're at, um, we're at an inflection point where I think that um, technology is advancing at a, at a pace that's very fast. And, you know, again, technologies don't care how they're used. So thinking more and more about how artificial intelligence and machine learning can be used for social good versus um, 
other uses, right? There's a delicate balance. And, um, you know, ultimately, I think that artificial intelligence can be a force for good. There are many applications that we can think about using it for, from healthcare to medicine to helping people express their creativity, um, as well as, you know, pr helping pe provide people access to s services and skills that they might not otherwise have. You can think about, um, um, right, so um, social services, lawyers, um, parts of their jobs can be um, made available to more and more people who are in needy sort of situations, figuring out how to route resources to different parts of the world, um, help growing economies. Uh, these are all ways that I think artificial intelligence can play small roles, and people are definitely working on these things. And these are examples of where I think AI can be used for social good. And um, But of course, it's not guaranteed that artificial intelligence will be used that way. So one of the roles that um, we can have in academia is to say, here is how, here are the things that we think can achieve social good. Here's how we can do social good. Um, we can work with sociologists and ethicists and policymakers um, to kind of show the roadways or the pathways that get us towards more positive futures. Um, because right now, I think, you know, left as it is, artificial intelligence also has the ability to um, decrease access to resources to benefit uh, the people who are already in the uh, haves as less to the have-nots. And so I think we, what we can ultimately do is kind of show the paths that we think we can take and show where the outcomes could be and then bring that to society as a whole and to see you know, what decisions we can make as a collective. So what I hear, and I'm going to put on my little bias hat, AI is good. It's awesome because we can have all of this social good in terms of healthcare, care, um, even lawyers. So I know our listeners are out there and they're thinking, yeah, but I'm, 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 I might be convinced. I don't know. And so ultimate question, AI is good. We're just going to assume that. It can amplify our workforce. It can provide all of this social benefit. Or... Will it really just hurt us? And I heard opportunities for people. Yeah, well, you know, I am the optimist. And <laughs> I think ultimately we will find the ways to improve our society and our culture and our world through technology. Um, in the end, I think that, you know, all technology is really kind of a lens through which, or a mirror through which we can um, really reflect on our own culture and our own society and our own values. Uh, what are the things that we build? Why do we build them? And um, in that sense, you know, looking at what we build, how we build it, why we build it, provides a lot of insight into ourselves. And I think this alone is really kind of one of the benefits of artificial intelligence, is the ability to stop and reflect on what our goals and our values are. Well, this is great. I mean, I learned so much. I learned about creativity, democratization of AI, social benefit, and also how we can maybe ease some of the pain of, of workforce displacement. Um, I, I appreciate this. I, thank you. This has been really good. It's been my pleasure to be here. So we appreciate Mark for, for joining us in this podcast today um, to discuss these important points concerning automation and the future of the workforce. As always, be sure to check out ic.gatech.edu for updates and feature content on our school and follow us on social media at ic.gt. Thanks for listening.